Hello everyone, this is Suzanne Hubbard and this is Talk Time. In 2018, there were 20,353 drug overdoses. And these were calls to 911 where people called and the police had to go out to a crisis situation. 4,373 of those 20,353, that's 21%, were opioid overdoses alone. In 2018, 6,287 doses of naloxone was administered and reported. That's a 35% increase from 2017. And in the state of Alabama in 2018 was the highest in Jefferson County and the surrounding areas, which is in our region. And males from the ages of 15 to 44. In 2017, the top 10 overdose drugs was number one, fentanyl, number two, heroin, number three, methamphetamines, four, cocaine, five, alprazam, six, oxycodone, seven, hydrocodone, methadone, morphine, and 10 was tramadol. Now, a good many of these are opioid derivatives. Now, I want to introduce you to someone who could tell us more about the personal cost of this overdose tragedy situation epidemic that we have. This is Miss Angie Cheshire. Angie, hey. hi there. Hi, thank you for having me. Thank you for being here and thank you for coming in and helping us understand this situation. Tell me about your son, Joshua. My Joshua, he was small town boy, mm -hmm. raised here in Wadley, um, straight A student all through school, played baseball, just a smart, well-rounded, all-around little boy. Loved sports, loved, of course, Nintendo at right. that time. Um, just anything. He liked to be outside, fish some, but his main love was the Nintendo and baseball. And um, straight up through, I guess, about seventh grade, that was him. He was schoolwork, baseball, schoolwork, baseball, just bright, laughing. You know, he had, he had his bad days like other kids did, but mm -hmm. uh, all in all, he was just a small town boy. Right. Just sweet as he could be. And you told me that he had trouble in school. Even though he was a straight A student, he had problems. Can you tell me about some of his frustrations that he had? I can. He was uh, probably fifth grade. He was diagnosed with OCD, mm -hmm. and his obsession was numbers, counting all the time. And uh, even though he was excellent with math, he would take just a regular sentence, and by the time you said it to him, he was like, mm -hmm, "Okay, there were so many words in that, and each, you know, so many letters," mm -hmm. and it got to where it was messing with him in school. I mean, he could. Take algebra, for instance. He could look at the at the question, give you the an answer, but he would get frustrated with trying to work out the problem right. because he already had it answered. Right. So uh, he went on medication for that, and you know, counseling for that, and they finally got him settled in on something that would help him. But I eventually had to take him out and homeschool him. Right. And how did he do in homeschool? Did he still 
maintain contact with his peers and enjoy extracurricular activities? He did. We did the uh, the homeschooling, and you know he'd get up in the mornings, do that, mm -hmm. have his afternoons open so he could still play ball when it was the season. Friends would still come over. They'd play ball in the front yard, or he would go to their house, or you know skating and things like that, and. Mm -hmm. uh, just just carried right on, still straight A's all the way with his homeschooling. Now I homeschooled my son and he told me and he has told some of his friends that he found that he had more of a social life and more of a personal life not being in school. That he had more time for friends and, and his extracurricular stuff being homeschooled. Right, and, mm -hmm. and Josh was kind of that way because mm -hmm. just Example, if he got through on Friday mornings, you know, by lunch or so with his schoolwork and mm -hmm. he wanted to say go spend the night with one of his friends or even at my sister's house with her kids, then he could leave a little bit earlier on Friday mm -hmm. instead of having to wait until Saturday morning. Right. So he, he did have more time to enjoy stuff. That's great. Now, he had all these dreams and he had all these things that he wanted to do. Share with me some of his, his dreams and his aspirations. He always wanted to be, of course, a professional baseball player, mm -hmm. but he messed up an ankle in school, so mm -hmm. that kind of knocked that out. And with the Nintendo and, and those games going up, you know, new, new games, new equipment and stuff, he thought, <laughs> He wanted to be um, a programmer, mm -hmm. you know, and make the games themselves, but he didn't make it that far. He got out of school and decided, okay, before I go to college, I want to go out and work some. Mm -hmm. So he got connected up with some people that do resets, they call them resets in places mm -hmm. like Lowe's and things like that, setting up, um, gosh, I don't know what you'd call them, like flooring mm -hmm. exhibition type things. And so he took out on the road doing that at 17. Right, because the allure of money. Yes, mm -hmm. and lots of it. Right, because, I mean, that is extremely lucrative job. It is, mm -hmm. especially for a 17-year-old. Right, <laughs> right. So... When, at what point did you notice that something wasn't right anymore? Um, I'm going to think somewhere along 1920, um, you could see changes in him and I didn't know a whole lot about any of the types of drugs or, or what to look for. You know, I was always one of those, hey, he's smart, not my child. He knows better. Right. You know, he wasn't raised that way, blah, blah, blah. All those things that anybody could say. But you would notice small things like uh, he'd avoid eye contact with you. He would be looking for something with a flashlight all the time and not being able to find it. And I know I put it here and you know, things like that, mm -hmm. and um, eventually, you know, I just asked him point blank because he was, if you didn't ask him point blank, you didn't get a straight answer, but Josh was very truthful. If you sit like this and ask him a question, you better be prepared because you're going to get the answer. Right. And that's when the heartbreak started. Right. So did he come out and tell you that I'm using? He did. Um, at one point in time, I asked him, I said, Josh, what are you on? What, I mean, what have you done? Because you're just, you know, you're all over the place. Mm -hmm. And it was pain pills. Mm -hmm. Of course, the hydrocodone, you know, Lorset things back in the day. Mm -hmm. and, uh, that well, was, let's go back to what made him begin to take those medications. That, I, I really don't know. It all, from what I gathered, started when he was out on the road working. 
and it might have been you know they worked 12 and 14 hours because when they they'd have a schedule to get this job done mm -hmm. pack up get to another town and get that job done and you know in certain times so that's all I could think was the hours mm -hmm. and I know some of the kids would take them because they'd give them energy right. you know and, and plus the aches and pains that probably went along with all the lifting but that's mm -hmm. he never he never specified that right because I know that you told me at some point he had a couple of car accidents mm -hmm. which did extreme physical damage to his body right and but was, he already had a usage issue before he had that. those right. he's he had been using on and off for probably 10 years mm -hmm. Um, he didn't live with me, you know, he's, right. once he got in his 20s, he's grown man, did what he wanted to do. Right. And, um, and that's what he done. But then he got to the point where he had a son. Mm -hmm. He was working a uh, meat cutter in grocery stores and just, you know, home and everything. And then that fell apart. Mm -hmm. So he moved back home with me. And that's when I found out how really bad it had been. Mm -hmm. um, he would still use, but not around me, not in my house. And at times when he had, he would come in and he'd go straight to bed. You know, he didn't want me to see him that way. Right. But I seen him. Right. And two, as a mother having raised this child, and being constantly with this kid growing up, I'm sure that you realize something is just not right. right. He's not acting like himself. There's something going on. And it's, you couldn't put your finger on it, but you knew it was something right. wrong. When, at what point, was he using the most? I would say from the ages of... 20 to 25 mm -hmm. in that area and and you know all of his friends were too mm -hmm. it wasn't just him it was there were several probably six or seven of them mm -hmm. always together same click worked together <clears throat> stayed together so you know everything one of them done they all done right and I'm sure they enabled each other mm -hmm. one of them just you know just I, I'm thinking about not doing this anymore because it was constantly around them, right. they continued to feed each other's habits. Exactly, and right. he, you know, when he when he did quit and uh, he actually went to rehab, mm -hmm. when he come out, he said it's so hard to be around mm -hmm. my friends, people that I I call my brothers and my sisters that I, I love dearly, and they would die for me because it's hard to turn it down when everybody says, "Here, you want some? You want some?" And uh, he said that was that was the hardest part of it, just constantly having to turn somebody down. Right. And two, these accidents that he had, I know in one of them, he damaged his neck and his back. Mm -hmm. And can you tell us about what kind of injuries and what his pain level was on a regular basis? Ooh. Well, the first one, he was uh, one of them, Green Ground Mountain in Anston, mm -hmm. and hydroplaned, went off the side of the mountain, and hit an oak tree that was probably yay big around, mm -hmm. about four feet off the ground, head on. And that jarred his neck, his upper back, uh, busted his face up, and the doctors told him, you know, it, it kind of kinked his neck a little bit, mm -hmm. and they told him then, you're not gonna be able to take any more impact on your spine. Mm -hmm. So there for a while, I took him back and forth to work. Mm -hmm. Or when I was still working, we worked real close to each other, so he'd just ride with me. I'd drop him off, go to work, mm -hmm. pick him up, come home. <clears throat> but then he had another wreck on the way to work one morning, he fell asleep. Mm -hmm. And probably four miles from our house, he went to sleep, he went off the side of the road, upside down, 
down an embankment head on into a tree. Mm -hmm. And they thought the C1 and 2 vertebrae in his neck were broke. Mm -hmm. So he had massive neck, shoulder, upper back pains, migraines, mm -hmm. and anytime he went somewhere to try to, you know, find out how bad it was, see what he could do to get help, they thought he was just just seeking drugs. Ain't nothing wrong with you. Because they had records and documentation from when he was from in when rehab. He was in rehab. Right. And they put that label on him mm -hmm. and denied him access to much needed right. health care. Right. Because of the stigma. Right. You know. They're they're not really hurting, they're just hunting drugs. Right. And, and there's a lot of people that that applies to. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have the disc at home, you know, the DVD that shows his test on his neck and stuff, and the vertebrae in his neck were turned nearly completely sideways. Mm -hmm. But numerous trips to emergency rooms, they didn't help him. Right. And how did that make him <coughs> feel when he tried to go and get help or something to be just to be turned down and denied and pushed aside and dismissed because he was a former drug user. It was terrible. He mm -hmm. was he would cry. He's like, Mom, nobody wants to see us get well. Nobody wants to help us to where we can lead a productive life and work every day. They label us as no good and junkies and drug dealers and drug users and most of them will say the world's better off without us. And he spent, he cried many times, many mm -hmm. times. And then the anger from it, he was like, why should I try? You know, right. nobody's going to let me try anyway, so why should I? So how do you think that, that his being in constant pain with headaches and, and just agony, constantly and being denied proper health care. Do you think that that led him to some other mental issues because of this? Oh yeah, anxiety, mm -hmm. depression. Mm -hmm. um, there was times he wouldn't leave the house. Mm -hmm. um, he wouldn't get on Facebook, he wouldn't answer his phone. But then there was times he would get on Facebook and he'd just blast the world, you know, mm -hmm. tell him. Tell him how he really felt, you know. <laughs> mm -hmm. But uh, it, it's sad to watch because as a mom of a, you know, 29, 30-year-old man, you can hug him, you can tell him, I got your back. But, but the world doesn't. And some things you can't do for right. Right. That stigma with that label is the cruelest thing that one person can do to another one. Because mm -hmm. he asked for help so many times and he couldn't get it. Right. And do you think that, that this dismissing, this frustration, this anger, led this man who had cleaned up his life and was struggling to get back on the right track. Do you think that's what drove him to take it one more time? I think, honestly, because he had just started a new job mm -hmm. and he was working, he was painting, painting mm -hmm. up at Jacksonville State College so happy. I, I was in the hospital that week. I had surgery on my neck and he would send me pictures, you know, looking out the windows. Hey mama, I hope you're okay. I think he just thought that he, after two years of being clean, that he was strong enough, mm -hmm. you know, and that he could do it and it wouldn't, it wouldn't take him back down that road because now he did have something to look forward to. Mm -hmm. And he wasn't thinking about, you know, the dangers of it anymore because he was, 
Josh was, you just had to know him. He was six foot tall, bulletproof. And uh, I just really think that he thought, hey, I can do this and, mm -hmm. you know, and not go back to doing it all the time. Right. Just this once. Mm -hmm. And that's all it took. Right. He had been clean for two years and a predator came along, someone from his past came and tempted him mm -hmm. and he gave in that one last time. He did. They gave it to him and he went into my sister's house. That's where he was staying because he didn't have a vehicle to get back and forth from here up there to work. And up mm -hmm. in Aniston, they would come by and pick him up. Mm -hmm. So this person came by and they gave it to him. And when he went inside to take a shower before dinner, he never came out of the bathroom and my sister and his girlfriend busted down the bathroom door and found him. Mm -hmm. From the point in time that the girl gave him that heroin, already in a syringe, fixed up, ready to go. Mm -hmm. I mean, they wasn't no spoon, burnt, none of that. Ready to go. From the time she gave it to him to the time that he was blue, laying in the bathroom floor, dead was about 25 minutes. Mm -hmm. And at the time, you had just had surgery mm -hmm. and you were recuperating at home. You had just been released from the hospital that day, correct? Uh, the day before. The day before. And tell us how you found out. Oh, uh, well, actually, I was I was sitting at my desk, and I was actually getting ready to go to bed because <clears throat> they had done a fusion on my neck, and I was full of flexorels and, you know, this collar on my neck, so it was just, it was bedtime, and my brother came through the door. He, he lives next door to me with my mom and said, do you feel like going to Aniston? I said, depends. Mm -hmm. He said, well, it's Josh. <clears throat> and I just looked at him. I mean, he was like, we need to go. They they took him to the hospital by him. Mm -hmm. Gene, and he told me, he said, Gene found him in the floor, already blue, in the bathroom. And I just told him, I said, brother, there's no need to be in a hurry. Mm -hmm. My baby's gone. But, you know, I mean, I, of course we'll go. Mm -hmm. There's no way I wouldn't go. Mm -hmm. I said, but there's just, there's no need in, in getting in a big hurry and risk getting hurt getting there because he's gone. Right. And I knew it. Mm -hmm. Now, as a mother, I'm sure that that call in, in mm -hmm. your brother's news was the absolute most hellacious, nightmarish information that you possibly could have ever received. Tell me what kind of support or non-support, what additional traumas you have had to deal with since you found out that your child had died? Oh. I had to go, even though they picked him up in my sister's house. I had to go in the emergency room and identify my son. Right. The police were everywhere. They wanted to know who gave it to him. Mm -hmm. They terrorized my grandson, which was Josh's son. He was eight at the time. When he and his mother got there, they snatched them apart because somebody had told the police that an ex-girlfriend gave it to him. So they thought it was her. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and the trauma just, honey, 
them coming in there and getting us to sign donor papers, even though it had on there, cannot be a donor. Mm -hmm. We still had to sign those papers saying he could not be an organ donor, which he was an organ donor. But since he had been dead and they were just trying to revive him, you know, why the bloody would you do that to somebody? Knowing that they couldn't be anyway. Right. And, you know, the investigation, it, the coroner line, when, when I'd call and ask him about, oh, you know, the toxicology test like that. Well, I don't know if they were done. It says on the death certificate they were. Mm -hmm. Well, let me check on it. Let me check on it. And this rocked on until October. Finally got those results back in January. And come to find out, he never sent them to the forensics lab until Halloween, from July 21st to Halloween. He's telling me he's going to check on something that he hadn't even done. All of the energy that I ever had when Josh was sick, you know, when Josh would call and say, Mom, I need you, or Josh had been in a wreck. It, you know, you, you spend a lot more time looking out for your kids than you actually realize until mm -hmm. something happens to one of them. I'm sitting at home and I'm looking at all these pictures and I'm thinking, nobody's doing anything for my son mm -hmm. or my grandson. And that energy had me about just wanting to run through the wall. I was ready to just lose it. Mm -hmm. I had to be put on medication. And I fought, I fought with the police, the investigators, task force, uh, you know, calling the FBI, DEA, state of Alabama. Uh, our state representative here, Mr. Fincher, God love his soul, has has talked me through so much and helped me every way he could. And it, it's just been an uphill battle. Every every bit of it is an uphill battle. Mm -hmm. It's like he did this to himself, you know. What do you want us to do about it? I want that predator off of the street. She had right. six other previous uh, convictions. Convictions. Right. Two for distribution, four for, for possession. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I'm getting where I can't talk. And she's walking the street, happy as she can be. No consequences, no justice. No consequences whatsoever. Right. Well, since all of that happened to you, you have channeled that energy and that, that time that you used to spend. You advocate for your son. You advocate for these victims of drug overdose. You have made progress with your advocacy. Tell us about this new law. I am trying really hard mm -hmm. to get a drug-induced homicide law, which it was drawn up and presented last year in legislation. They changed it to drug-induced murder. Mm -hmm. I'll take it. Right. Um, it, you know, if they pass that, then it will carry a 20-year sentence, mm -hmm. $20,000 fine. Mm -hmm. And even more of the sentence if the person has previous drug convictions. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people don't want it because they say locking up all the people that use drugs is, you know, it's not going to help them. Well, it may not. But if I give it to you, and I know... You, ha you hadn't used this in mm -hmm. two years, but I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to talk you into mm -hmm. using it, and I'll leave, and you die. I ought to be held responsible for right. that. And two, it would hold people, these pushers that give people dirty meds. Yes. 
accountable yes. and some consequences. Exactly, because right now, as Alabama law has it, there is no law on the book for it. I mean, now there mm -hmm. is for, for drunk driving. Mm -hmm. If I'm driving drunk and I kill you, then I can be charged. Right. But if I give you drugs, mm -hmm. depending on what county you're in. Right. Tell me about what you have found in your advocacy work. You've got, you brought that up. Some counties have a higher you know, consequences for mm -hmm. people who who do these kind of activities versus in what kind of difference does Alabama versus 25 other states? Well, 25 of the states have passed drug-induced homicide laws. Mm -hmm. Alabama, it seems the law changes at every county line right. because places like Huntsville, over in Jefferson County, um, I think Shelby County, mm -hmm. there are incidences and they are reported by the DOJ that the Department of Justice has prosecuted federally mm -hmm. just from one person being given heroin and dying. So what I don't understand is if they can do that in Jefferson County, in Shelby County, in Huntsville, Coleman, larger cities, mm -hmm. why can't they do that 65 miles away? Right. You know, mm -hmm. my child did not go out looking for the drugs that killed him. No. He was hunted down and, get, you know, he didn't have to take it. Mm -hmm. And he's a grown man. But... I don't, I don't know why. I'll never know why. But I want to see the law in place that every county is treated equally. Mm -hmm. If the feds are going to prosecute it, then I want the feds to prosecute it. If mm -hmm. it's going to be up to the counties, I want them to do it. But I want them to have what they need. Mm -hmm. Like uh, the State Bureau of Investigation told me, please don't quit. We need this law so we have something to stand on when we do make these rules. And 72,000 kids a year in the United States. Mm -hmm. Those are brothers, sisters, mothers, fathers, aunts, uncles, grandkids. I mean, you know, if you stop and think of those 72,000 that's died, and you mm -hmm. think of their families, right. you think of their kids, mm -hmm. somebody's got to stand up for those kids. Right. Or when those kids get 15, 20 years old, they may fall in the same path that that parent did. Right. And what percentage, because you have talked to a lot of mothers, a lot of brothers, a lot of sisters, a lots of aunts and uncles, friends, neighbors, relatives, of these people who have died of drug overdoses, what percentage do you think that the people that you talk to, that you have known personally, that you have heard stories about, what percentage of those people do you think are self-medicating for some injury or some mental illness that has been in, uh, not addressed? or some pain issue that because mm -hmm. possibly they have had a history of substance abuse that people refuse to take them seriously and mm -hmm. dismiss them. What percentage of the people that you are aware of do you think, do you think it's a high percentage or a low percentage? What is your estimation of people who have been kind of at an early disadvantage that get trapped and die? I think that percentage would be high mm -hmm. because just like in Josh's case with the OCD, you know, mm -hmm. and, and he was on medication for that, when he got old enough that he lost his insurance, mm -hmm. you know, then he didn't have any way to control all these thoughts. Right. So just like with him, I'm sure there's people with ADHD, you know, people with knee problems, mm -hmm. back problems, whatever, that Severe don't have anxiety. anxieties, mm -hmm. that, that do not have insurance or any any means of getting 
help, so they just get it wherever they can find it. Right. I think probably one out of, I think I read somewhere in the statistics, one out of every five people you meet on the street has a substance abuse problem. Right. And that's pretty darn high. That is very high. And especially, it seems like a whole generation of our youth is gone now mm -hmm. because of the opioid epidemic and because of not having access to proper health care, mental health care treatment. Right. We are losing our whole future because of not having basic health services in place to help these people. Right. And as a consequence, you've got mothers, you've got children being raised by the system or grandparents. Mm -hmm. Now, tell me, how hard is it? Because I know Josh had a partner who did not have these issues that could raise their child. Right. But there are so many people that both parents are MIA. Mm -hmm. And the grandparents have to take up and raise the babies that are left behind. Mm -hmm. Tell me what you think that they need help with. And do they have any resources for help to pick up the slack where these, these parents who are not there because of this substance abuse issue mm -hmm. and their addiction, what kind of resources are available to them? Very limited, mm -hmm. very limited. And especially like um, if it's a female, mm -hmm. you know, you've got a mother that just, she wants to stay high, she runs off, she leaves her kids. Mm -hmm. She doesn't want to give those kids to somebody because that's her Medicaid. Right. That's her food stamps, both of which can help her to either get her Suboxone mm -hmm. to sell to get something else right. or sell food stamps mm -hmm. to go get something else. The grandparents are just like, here's the kids, take care of them. And, and most of them will because they don't want them in the system. Yeah. You never know when mom's going to come back in. You never know when dad's going to come back in who they're going to bring in the house with them. Mm -hmm. You know, the instances of you've got kids running around the house that may pick up a spoon that's just had heroin burn in it. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, all those risks. And the grandparents have no help. They don't have anybody to stand up and say, okay, we're going to help you with custody of these kids so you can take them to the doctors. You can help them get therapy you know, whatever they need. We'll, we'll help you get them signed up for Medicaid, food stamps. They don't have that. Mm -hmm. I've seen it firsthand. Even though there's a paper you can fill out on out of court online to get emergency custody, you fill it out, you take it to the judge. Mm -hmm. They tell you it's not any good, you gotta have a lawyer. Right. Most of you lawyers won't, when you say custody, 1500 bucks. Mm -hmm. The very least. Yes, and the majority of people that I know that are grandparents do not have the means to spit out $1,500 for an attorney. Right. They, they just don't have it. Especially having taken the financial burden of raising their children's children. One, two, or three and, kids. Right. right. They don't have the extra resources to give to that. Right, because they have to buy school clothes, you know, mm -hmm. computers if they need to do the schooling at home now. And their little diapers formula. So there is no help. And that, that needs to be changed. I think from personal experience that there ought to be a way that the family courts can just say, okay, until we can settle this, mm -hmm. the kids are in your house, you've been taken care of them, we're gonna give you emergency custody 
So you can go and apply for the other help that you may need mm -hmm. since you have stepped up and are willing to take care of these kids. You know, instead of putting them in the system somewhere and possibly splitting up two or three kids, right. you know, because it's not their fault. They're already, they're, the children are already carrying the, what's wrong with mama? What's wrong with daddy? Why don't they want me? Or they have been taking care of mama and been a parent for mama or daddy, cleaning up vomit or whatever the situation mm -hmm. called for. Some of them have been sexually abused right. and Physically. trafficked it out, you know, for drug money and exchange of favors and all this kind of stuff. And you've got traumatized individuals that need help too. Right. They're victims. Right, and without some sort of custody papers, grandparents can't take them. Right. Any type of mental health, the parent has to make that initial appointment mm -hmm. and be there when those appointments are going on in case they need to be spoken to about, you know, okay, this, this could be something that makes this child dangerous. You right. know, the kids have anger issues, mm -hmm. and there's, there's no help there for the grandparents, and that's a shame. Right. There's a lot of elderly people across the nation, but especially in the South, mm -hmm. there's a lot of elderly people that are taking care of and raising their grandkids. Or great grandkids. Or great grandkids. Yes. yes. In several cases. With no help whatsoever. Right. Same. What are the other things that you would like to see addressed and changed that desperately need changing in regards to this issue? Uh, public education, mm -hmm. what to look out for, signs and symptoms of all drug abuse, not just opiates, but meth, you know, all of it. Mm -hmm. Because so many people don't know that when, when somebody comes in from work and doesn't want to eat, but they say they're starving and da 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 da, you know, they, they could be on meth. They may not be, but they could be. And I know with your advocacy that you are pushing for education in lower grades and also education of, diff of family members. Right. So not only do children get exposed to education and consequences earlier or help if that right. needs to be addressed in their own families, but you're also looking at educating parents who may have a potential drug problem in their own home that they may not be aware of or they right. have some idea that something's going on but they don't know and you're pushing for that education right. as well. Education in mm -hmm. all forms for parents, mm -hmm. you know, public, general public, mm -hmm. and especially in the schools for the peer pressure, the bullying, mm -hmm. especially the bullying of uh, you know, mental health for the anxiety and depression. Just my grandson just turned 11 years old. Mm -hmm. There are kids on the computer bullying him, making jokes at him, laughing at him because his daddy died from drugs. Right. That's just, that's, you know, he had to be taken out of that school and put in another school because they were bullying him and messing with him so much at school and nothing was being done about it. Right. So mom up and moved and put him in another school. Right. So he could get a clean slate. Right. Nobody knew and, anything. You know, it's not the but kids. No. It's not the kids' fault. You know what the parents do, but they have to live. These young kids have to live mm -hmm. with what anything good or bad that your parents do. Right. You know they've got to live with that. Right. But especially when it's bad, people just jump on that. Right. And they want this kid to try to outlive the legacy of, you know, your dad was a drug addict, your mom's a dope mm. it, Yeah. You know, things like mm -hmm. that. And it's not a child's fault. And that causes a lot of anxiety, a lot of anger. Depression. Well, depression. Mm -hmm. And you know what the anger is going to lead to eventually. Right. Trouble. Mm -hmm. Of some sort. Right. Either anger directed inward, which mm -hmm. becomes depression, or out, which becomes burglary, threat, theft, assault. assault, battery, homicide. It's not a good outcome. No. For I think issues. 
anybody that has anything to do with substance abuse, whether mm -hmm. it be the person that's getting high, mm -hmm. the person that is getting high that wants to stop, mm -hmm. a family member, a child in that family, the grandparents, ought to be able to have immediate help mm -hmm. if they ask for it. Right. Because rehabs are so expensive. Mm -hmm. Then you've got some of the halfway houses that are gonna charge you $175 a week. You work all day, you come in, you clean, you know, you clean house. You might go to one meeting a week. That's not rehab. No. That's what that's they call a clean, a, a sober living home. But that's not treatment for for your abuse or the underlying causes that may be, mm -hmm. you know, rearing their ugly head. Right, which brings me to my next point. Do you think that, that there are adequate resources for people who want help? No. And what do you think that the system needs to provide for these people to get back on their feet? You know, um, because I know through talking to you, you have made me aware that um, there's a federal program for people who suffer from HIV. Mm -hmm. They get um, temporary or even permanent health insurance mm -hmm. so they can live and survive. Right. And, you know, looking into that program, it would be really nice to provide the same for those people that are suffering from this medical illness called substance abuse. Yes, most definitely, mm -hmm. because the, the insurance you're talking about does not cost that individual anything. Right. All they have to be, do is be diagnosed with HIV or AIDS, and they automatically have insurance mm -hmm. for the rest of their life. Right. Medicine's taken care of, doctors, surgeries, anything. And I think somebody that has a substance abuse problem mm -hmm. should have that same program. Not necessarily Medicaid, but some type of program like that to where if they want to go to rehab, if they've got an insurance card, they can go to rehab. Mm -hmm. If they need treatment for the HIV, um, Hep C, Hep C mm -hmm. stuff like that, that drug use can lead to, right. they need a way to be treated for that. And right now they don't have it. 90% of the time, it's up to mom and dad right. to and take care of it. Mom that. or dad is trying to raise grandchildren mm -hmm. or, you know, financially strap themselves. They can't do it. it. Right, and especially for like Hep C, mm -hmm. you can get the treatment in different places around the state. They have like clinics you can go and they'll help you get the treatment for free. Mm -hmm. But you've got to have been clean for six months and be able to pass drug test. Right. Or that's the way it used to be. Now, if you've got somebody that's really out there and they've been trying to stay clean to do this, and the system just keeps beating them down every time they ask for help mm -hmm. in other ways. You know, you can't get food stamps because you don't have a regular address. You, if you go to the hospital because you're you're hurt, well, you're seeking drugs. You know, then right. you can't get that done, and that helps. See, eventually, it's going to turn liver cancer, kill you. You know, mm -hmm. who knows? Mm -hmm. It's just, it's not right to me. Right. But to me, everybody that has any sort of life experience with substance abuse, if they ask for help, they should get that help. Right, because it affects so many people. And right. it's just so detrimental to their health and the health and safety of everyone around them. Right. Mm -hmm. Angie, in wrapping things up, is there any message that you want to tell people about your experience, Josh's experience, anything that you can think of that you want people to know and, and realize and take with them. Educate yourself. Mm -hmm. If you have any idea somebody's doing drugs, Google it, look it up, talk to somebody, find me, call me. Mm -hmm. 
you know, we've got the new group, Help Alabama Recover. Anybody that's in it will be glad to, to talk to anybody. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, don't turn somebody away when they're asking for help. Mm -hmm. For the parents, grandparents, whoever that's fighting for change and standing up for all these kids, don't stop. Don't back down. Mm -hmm. One voice may be one voice, but when you put all those voices together, eventually we'll be heard. We got the proclamation for the state of Alabama for mm -hmm. Overdose Awareness Day, first time ever. Mm -hmm. And We're that's getting, Monday, August the 31st. 31st. Yes, mm -hmm. so voices are being heard. Right. And those small steps so eventually will make a difference. Mm -hmm. And never say not my child. No, because it could happen to any of us. Mm -hmm. cool. Thank you so much, Angie, for all that you do, not only to find justice and, and help people like Josh, but thank you for all of us mothers that our children are still with us because you help safeguard our families and help those that are coming after your children, your grandchildren, my children. You're helping them have a chance at not ever having to deal with the issues that you have had to deal with, unfortunately. And I'm sorry for your loss. I'm so sorry that Josh made a mistake that ended up costing him his life. I'm so sorry. Thank you. But you are a strong woman and you have turned it around to benefit everyone. I'm trying. I know. Thank you for letting me tell the story right. and, and try to get some messages out there. There's, mm -hmm. there's help online that you can find, mm -hmm. you know, for statistics and information if you're in doubt. And I'm going to post those and they are going to be on the screen. So people can have, you know, it. I'm going to play it slow enough to please, if you or someone that you know or someone that you think that you might know has an issue, please, number one, don't give up. Don't give in. Stay strong. And there is hope. And there are resources. And I will be providing you with those. Thank you, Angie, for Thank everything you. that you do. Thank you so much for letting me talk. Mm. And this is Suzanne Hubbard with Talk Time. Thank you, and y'all stay safe out there.